I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, West Side. And still reside in New Orleans? Yes, sir. Growing up, what was it like for you in New Orleans? Can you paint that picture for us? I don't know, just typical life of a um, kid running around, stealing bikes, and getting into, get, getting into all kinds of mischievous things, you know. Nothing too, nothing too out of the ordinary. Was it a rough upbringing for you? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It was, you know, rough is normal for us. Like, so when people say rough, uh, it was hard. Like, it's hard for me to say, like, it was hard. It's just, it's normal. It's, it's normal to live rough because we don't know what it's like to, you know, we don't know what it's like to live good. Financially, how did you grow up? Oh, we was, we was very poor. My mom was very poor. My mom was on drugs when we grew up, so, you know, she was in and out of prison, wasn't home a lot, so we we basically, you know, raised ourselves for the most part. I got an older brother and an older sister, and we also have a um, younger sister, so our older brother and my older sister pretty much, like, had a big hand in raising us. Where was dad? Um, same thing. Running the streets, drugging, you know, him and mom were doing the same thing. Were they together? No, um, off and on, off and on through my childhood. Um, my mom and dad, it was here and there. He was, he was there, then he wasn't there, then, you know, he'll pop back up. At this point in your life, what terms are you on with your mother? What terms are you on with your father? Right now, me and my mom, um, me and my mom are on pretty good terms right now. Actually, you know, I just started a business and um, I actually hired her. She one of the main cooks for my business I just started. And what business is that? Um, I, I have a um, food truck in New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. And what does she do specifically? She's the cook on the food truck. I don't know how to cook, so she the cook. I I'm see. just the sponsor, you know, I'm just the, um, the manager, the, um, you know, the CEO, the mm -hmm. owner. That's the only hand in it I have. And uh, what about your father? What terms uh -huh. are you on with your father? Man, for the last, the last couple of years, I say the last since my daddy been back home, my daddy went, you know, done some time in prison. He done like six years straight. And for the last six, seven years he been home, we've been pretty good. We've been pretty good for the most part. Like, you know, he helped me, um, he helped me with the food truck. He built it. He built the food truck. Mm. He, you know, he a jack of all trades. He's one of the men that's just like, you know how to do everything. So, you know, he built the food truck from ground up. So are your parents together at this point or no? Nah, my mom actually, um, actually married to someone else right now, yeah. I see. And my dad is married to someone else also. Your dad did six years in prison. Uh, state, federal? Um, state. Uh, for what exactly? Um, I believe it was a bunch of like drug charges and um, auto theft and it was a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff. He just was a career criminal, so a lot of the shit he did just caught up with him and he just, you know, wind up having to go lay down for a good six years. Yanni. Your your mother also did prison time herself. My mom did prison time also. She done she done two 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 and two and a half years, to be exact. And uh, what did she go to prison for? Um, same thing, drugs, normal drug charges, stuff like that, in that nature. You know, when you're doing drugs, living a life of crime, little petty crimes add up and catch up with you. State prison. Yeah, state prison. Yeah. Pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up without both of them, basically. You know. And when you say, you said your older sister raised you, or older brother? My older sister, and my older brother, like they looked after me and my little sister till we got older enough. Like you know, we was left inside with them. They ain't had no choice. And how much older were they than you? Um, they're about six years older than me. Mm. About six or seven years. So grandmother, grandfather, they never came into the picture? My grandmother, she helped out. She helped out when she could, when she was able to. She helped out for the most part. But for the most part, it was just us. We all we had, like me and my, me and my sisters and brothers, we all we had. Growing up in poverty, were your, was your family ever able to go higher up in class? 
like even to lower middle class? Nah, we never, nah. We, we always, we always was in different homes, getting evicted out of this home, moving this place, the lights off over here. We getting evicted over here. You know what I'm saying? We living with this family member. We living with that family member. It was, it was just always like that my whole childhood. The whole, my whole childhood, it was like that. Was there a point where, and it came to getting money, uh, was there a point where you chipped in? Yeah, I had to, you know, because um, at the age of like 15, 16, I'm becoming a young man and we still getting evicted, you know, with the lights still going on. You know what I'm saying? So I made some bad choices of the way I was getting money, you know, at the time. And, but I had to do what I had to do. I had to, you know, I had to chip in. I had to help out. I had to make sure the lights stayed on. I had to help out with the rent, you know, because, you know, mama probably went out, blew the money. I got to come up with the money. I got to make sure the lights off because I had a little sister to look after. When you said you're not proud of it, I'm assuming it's some street activity. Yes. Could you have gotten a job at 15? Oh. Um, could you have gone that route? I can't make excuses. I could have ever got a job because I always did had little hustles. I always did cut grass around the neighborhood, you know, wash cars around the neighborhood, run errands to the store for the older elders around the neighborhood. I had ways of getting money, but it wasn't enough money. It wasn't enough money to pay no light bill. It wasn't enough money to pay rent, you know. So when I got like 17, um, I got a job at Rallis in Burger King. Well, I couldn't hold on to a job long. So it was Burger King to Rallis, um, from Rallis to Popeyes, you know, just bouncing all over because I had a problem with authority, you know. I couldn't keep a job. I, I, I didn't listen to the bosses. You know, so I just bounced around a lot. Got fired from these jobs? Quit I got these fired. Jobs? I got fired within two months of every one of the jobs. I never worked over two months. I worked, no, I worked over two months of one job. I was working at this um this hotel. I was the um, maintenance man around the hotel. I worked there like four months. Yeah. And these other jobs you did, uh, what were you doing at each job? What was your position in the other jobs, like Burger King rallies? Burger King, I was on the um, sandwich line. I made sandwiches and rallies also, sandwiches. And um, I was in a fry station at Popeye's. I fried the chicken. I dropped the chicken. Right. And what were you getting fired for exactly? Um, you, you had being, a problem with authority, but what did you actually get fired for? Um, being Basically being lazy or... Uh, um, sneaking off from the job and trying to do other stuff and come sneak back, coming back off of lunch late, you know, because I was doing other stuff, trying to come back late. And, and then when the boss would tell me something, I, I catch an attitude where I didn't want to, I, I was very combative. So, you know, the boss would catch an attitude and the boss would tell me, well, yeah, you was gone for this time. And basically, I felt like they was talking to me like they was my mom or my dad. So, I kind of felt like you wasn't my mom and my dad, so you ain't had the right to talk to me out of line. Like, I felt like a lot of the fast food restaurants is not professional. You know, it's a certain way you're supposed to talk to people, and I felt like, you know, they felt they, they didn't have the need to, to be professional, and I was just wasn't having that. You incorporate that now into your own food business? Yeah, basically, I knew, I knew who I was. You know what I'm saying? I knew who I was growing up. And I knew that I had a problem with authority, and I didn't, I didn't like to have a boss. So I just became my own boss. Now, uh, were any of those jobs that you mentioned tough? Um, tough like what, hard work? Yeah, were they hard? No, none of the work was hard. It just was hard dealing with people over me. Like, I didn't want nobody to tell me nothing. Like, all I wanted you to do was train me and tell me what to do, and that's it. Don't fuss at me like you're my mama. Don't talk, catch an attitude with me. Don't tell me this. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me none of that because I ain't having it. I'm going to tell you to write the same thing back. So by me doing that, I was getting fired back to back 
every job I got, I just got fired for the same stuff. Any crazy stories dealing with any of these jobs that you just mentioned? Yeah. Anything that happened out of the norm? Um. Well, I, I got one story about Burger King. I had this um, my my boss. My boss used, used to talk to me any kind of way. I'm talking about like one time, my check was like a hundred dollars, and I had worked like two weeks, and I think I. She told me to do something, and I ain't do it when she told me to do it. And she's, she was like, get off my clock. Get off my clock. And she was like, get off my clock and go, because I, I, I used to ride the bike to work. And she said, take your little $100 check and get on your bike and get, and get on from around here. And that, that just made me feel low. That lowered my self-esteem, and th- it changed me. So it's like after I quit the jobs or whatever, after I got fired, I went, I went to the streets. I went back to the streets or whatever. So when I went back to the streets, I started making a, you know, a good, a good proportion of money. So I, one day I went to Burger King and she was on the um, drive through This is like three years later. Now I'm in the call, probably one of my homeboys or something. And I said, man, that sound like such and such other thing. That sound like the lady who used to be my boss. So we got to the window, it was her. And I probably was wrong for it, and I probably was childish at this moment when I'm thinking about it. But I had like $400 worth of $1 bills in my console. And when I pulled up to the, to the driver's window, I said, you remember me? She said, remember you from well? I said, you don't remember me? I used to work here. Then she looked at me good. She said, oh, I remember you. You was that small tail little boy. I took all the money and threw it in her face. All over the, it went all over the counter, all over by the drive through window. All the workers came out grabbing the money, picking the money up, and I just pulled off. I had a brand new truck and all that. I just felt, I felt good. That made me feel good. Because I'm the type of person that, like, I'm learning right now to forgive. Like, it's hard for me to forgive people. Like, you could be the dummy something 20 years ago. Like, I'll never forget it. And I'm gonna approach you when I see you like you did it yesterday. So that just based, I'm working on myself with that though, you know. If she were to see this interview, would you say anything to her now? I apologize. I apologize, I was young, you know. And I was, I was young and I was hurt. Like, you know, I was hurt about that. Like, you know, that hurt my feelings when you do this in front of all the rest of my coworkers, tell me go get on my bike. You know what I'm saying? Go take your little hundred dollar check and get on your bike. You know, I think my check was like $98 or something. And that ride home was the, the most shameful ride home, the most longest shameful ride home I felt played. Because they had, they had a female that I liked, as a matter of fact, that was working with me that day. And I was thinking about, you know, shooting my shot, getting at her. And she do this in front of her. I didn't want her to know how much my check was. So, you know, I just was embarrassed. You did? So, so I apologize to her, though. That's what I do. But from the outside looking in, it's like, you were embarrassed, she hurt your self-esteem, so when you do this drive-through money throw at her, it's like you try to lower her self-esteem and embarrass her back. Yeah, I wanted to show her like, I I wanted to show her like, I can throw money at you now. The little money that you degraded me and made me feel like the lowest person on earth about, I can throw that times four in your face and don't care, just pull off. I just wanted to show her like, I could throw your whole check. I could throw your whole check through your through the window at you and pull off. Just wanted her to feel how I felt that day. Mm. And well, then she probably don't even remember that particular event when she did that. You know what I'm saying? She just remember who I was. But you know, people do stuff, and you know what I'm saying. You don't know how it affect the next person. You know what I'm saying? You gotta watch. You know how you handle people. You don't know who you may hurt, curb. A certain type of people in this world that you just can't do certain things too, because they'll never forget it. And I'm one of them. Now, when it came to the street activity side of things, how young did that start for you? Um, About 15. About 15, I was was pretty much deep in it. I I guess I had a younger, I actually had a younger partner. He was like 13, and he was way deeper in it than me. He was probably 12. It was way deeper in it than me. He actually turned me on to it. Like me hanging around him, he got a gun. 
He's selling drugs. He only 12 years old. He got a big knot of money on him like this. You know, and I just wanted a part of it. You know what I'm saying? I figure I'm older than him. You know what I'm saying? And I'm looking up to him like, damn, this nigga getting all his money. And I just asked him to show me how to do it. And it was on from there. Were you the only one in your fam, aside from your parents, were you the only one in your family that, that, that took that street activity path? Nah. This is, this is a, this is a family, this is a generational curse. Like this is, this is our family. This is what we did, like to uncles, cousins, brothers, like none of us is strangers to the streets of prison or jail or street activity. Like this, this is what we did, this is what we did. This, this all I saw growing up. Now, obviously looking back, dealing with the streets, that can be a very risky path. Yeah. Especially when, I mean, you mentioned a gun, you mentioned selling drugs. Uh, there's consequences that can stem from that. There's a certain level of stress that can stem from that. Yeah. There's that looking over your shoulder feeling that can stem from that. Yeah. Violence, Violence, jail, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Worst case, death. Right. Did you know this stuff from the jump when you, when you, at 15? You know, at 15, I knew this stuff, but you know, at the age of 15, that not that real to you because at 15, I didn't ever really know nobody who died at that time. I didn't have friends that died. I didn't have family members at that time that died. So I never knew a person that died, except for my grandpa. My grandpa was dead at that time, but I never really knew people that was dead. So it wasn't that real to me. How did he pass? Um. I'm not sure how he, exactly how he passed. I know he was sick. Uh, I don't know what he was sick from, but I was like 10 years old when he passed. So I'm not sure exactly what he was sick from, but I just knew he was sick. Now, did you end up experiencing any of these obstacles that we just mentioned, especially jail or death, um, violence? Yeah, I definitely experienced jail, prison. You've, you've been to prison? Yeah. Uh, how much time did you end up doing? Um, I was sentenced to like three and a half years, but um, by me with good behavior and um, like programs with anger management, reentry, you know, I got out early. I wound up doing 12 months. One year? One year. And, and what was it for? Um, drugs. Yeah. State prison? State prison. What did this teach you? What did this experience teach you? What, prison? Yeah. Man, like hell, bro. Like, I don't know, it, it, it definitely tightened up my act and it definitely changed me. I can't necessarily say exactly right off hand what it taught me, but in prison it brought me close to the, um, it brought me close to the God. You know, and I definitely came out a different person with a different mind frame. You know, I thought I thought way different. I think way smart. I think things way. I think things all the way through. I'm not as high headed as I was. You know, so it may. It, you know, it's 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 bittersweet. It, it it's bittersweet. It it helped me in a lot of ways and it destroyed me in a lot of ways. <laughs> Did you ever have an exit strategy when it came to street activity? Exit strategy meaning like what? A plan to get out of it. When you were in it. Yeah, I believe I had I had plans, but I had plans. I can't necessarily remember exactly when. I think I wanted to start a barbershop at one time when I was doing it. Um I had I had ideas that I wanted to do, but it's like, it's, it's, you know, a drug dealer is just like, it's just like the fiend. You know, we know different from it. They're addicted to something, we also addicted to something. They're addicted to the drug, we're addicted to the money. You know, and I believe, I believe they should have a program actually to treat drug dealers, people who only know the streets and only know fast money. I think they should be treated just like, just like the fiend, just like drug drug addicts, because it's definitely something that's 
is it's something you can't help, I feel. Once you get into the field and get used to the fast money and the fast life, it's like hard to go get a job or nine to five or something. It just you go to nine to five, you get your little check and you just be looking at it like, man, I could have went did this and did that and made this amount. Oh, well. Taking that path of street activity, was there any regrets? Hindsight twenty twenty, looking back at yourself. Yeah, I definitely got one regret. One major regret. Um, um, one of my one of my cousins actually died to street activity, and I felt like I ain't set a good example for him because he actually came stay with me for a while before he passed, and um, I was doing the wrong thing, and by me doing the wrong thing, he watching me. You know what I'm saying? He see what I'm doing, so. I started like paying attention to him and I see that he doing it now. Like, you know, I see that he's slowly doing what I'm doing or trying to trying to mimic me or be like me. So I sent him back by his mama. You know, I told his mama like, you know, I'm not living right right now for him to be around me. Like, you know, I'm setting a bad example. And, you know, I feel like it's my regret because I could have changed my life right there. You know what I'm saying? To be there for him, and I feel like he probably wouldn't be dead if I'd have just set a great example and you know, and changed my life right then and there. I could, I feel like he'll still be alive. Feeling of guilt. Yeah, definitely, and it eat, it eat me up a lot. Ever sought therapy or counseling for this stuff? No, but um, I actually got a best friend. She um, she she's a um. What is she, a therapist or? Psychologist? Some, she's something in that field. I don't know exactly what she is. I got to ask her. But she actually told me I suffer from postpartum stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress? So, yeah, post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. She told me that. PTSD? Yeah, that's what she called it. And, you know, uh, I don't know if there's medica medication for that or counseling and therapy for that, but... If you have that, then that may be something you may want to research or check into, or right. Yeah, know. but yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I really, I want to research it and check into it because, like, I didn't know, I didn't know that I had that until I talked to her, and she just, I, I told, her I just want, I like, man, call me, I just need to talk to you. She like, what's going on with you? And I just went to tell her everything that's going on with me, and then that's what she said I suffer from. She was like, you know, she was like, that's what you suffer from. Oh, you got all the symptoms. That's what you suffer from. You need to um, really get treated for it. Maybe something you may want to consider. Yeah. Um, was it worth it? Was the risk worth the reward of what you got out of it? No. No. Nah. I wouldn't say it was worth it, cause it took a. You can't get time back. Time is like the most valuable thing, you know. You can't get it back, and I lost that time with my children. I had a disconnect. I had a um disconnect with my daughter when I came home. You know, she was like two or three years old when I went to prison. When I came home, a whole year out of a a toddler life is a lot, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get it back, you know. So we had like a disconnect and it took it took me a while to, you know, build that back up with her. You got it back though? Yeah, we got it back. We got our little bond. How'd you do it? Basically I had to find something that me and her both like. Um she liked music too. So every every morning when I bring her to school, that's what we do. We listen to music, we dance to music, and we sing music, you know, on Snapchat, Instagram. We post videos. You know, that's our little bond we do. While you were in street activity, uh, did you hide it from your parents at all, or were they aware? My mama definitely was aware. My mama definitely was aware. Like, she just, till this day, me and my mom never had a conversation about this. It's like, the, like, they would knock on the door, like people that I dealt with would knock on the door for me. 
in the middle of the night, and she'll just come call me and be like, that lady at the door for you, that man at the door for you. She know they fiends, cause she, you know, she she was clean at this time, so she used to be, you know, one of them, so she know what they at the door for. Like, so she never told me nothing. She just was like the lady that she always just like kinda like mind up business and let me learn from my own mistakes. Now, there's an interesting dynamic here. Um, when you go to prison, was your father still in prison at the time or he was out? No, my father was home. Okay. So my question to you is, your parents both did prison time for a certain length of time. Yeah. And then so. obviously there's a time where they find out you're going to prison. Yeah. Yeah. What was the feeling? What was the conversations? What? How did that... Well, you know, that was, like, even when I was going to prison, me and my mama never talked about my street activity. Like, she never, like, she knew, like, like, I got an older brother, and he didn't have been in prison, but he never was, like, in the prison for, like, real street activity. Like, you know, he wasn't never, like, knee deep in it like I was. So, so he basically, like, kind of like the good boy. He not a good boy, but he was the good boy compared to me, you know. So it's like my mom just looked at it like we still never had a conversation about the street activity. She just was like, a oh, baby going to jail. You know, that's all she said. A oh, baby going to jail, you got to be strong, son. You know, it's time for you to you know, man up. You know, got consequences come behind everything. You know. Obviously, when your cousin died, from street activity, you felt a certain guilt there. Yeah. I wonder if your parents ever felt any sort of way, maybe not the same guilt, but maybe if their actions of them had anything to do with you ending up that way. Um, I believe my mom probably, um, Felt she could have done a better job with us, and I would have turned out better. Um, but my mom, the type of person, is like she gonna hold that in. She not. It's like she avoid those conversations. With, that's probably a burden that she dealt with on her own. Mm. She never told me anything about it, but I believe that's very possible for her to be dealing with that. Um, this drug use that your mom did, and your dad did drug use as well. Yeah. Uh, what type of drugs were they on? Uh, cocaine, crack, crack cocaine. Were they both able to uh, get clean from them? Yeah, they both. Um, well, yeah, my mom, my mom definitely did. Um, I can't really speak for my dad, but um, my mom did. How'd she do it? Um, she told me prayer, prayer, and just don't want to change, don't want to, don't want to be there for her children, you know, don't not want to leave her children no more. You know, she very, she very, um, holy, you know, she, she believe in, you know, prayer, believe in, you know, she a loyal Christian. How long, go ahead. She a lawyer Christian, so she, you know, she's really into the Bible and, you know, stuff like that. So that's how she said she did it. How long was she on it for? Um, shit, it had to be like 20 years. Very long off time. And on, off and on, 20 years. Did you ever sell drugs to either of your parents? Nah. Nah, I could, I couldn't, I could never even. I didn't want to sell drugs to my uncle, you know. My uncle one time, one of my uncles one time approached me about it, and um, and I told him no, you know. And one of my cousins was like, "Man, you might as well sell it to him, you know. Somebody, one of these other niggas on the streets gonna sell it to him. They gonna get the money. You might as well do it." And I couldn't do it because that's like, you know. That was like my favorite uncle, you know, that's the uncle that I'm closest to. And and 
you know what? He cleaned the day. And I think that was one of the reasons. He cleaned his act up after that. Mm. He cleaned his act up after that. After I told him no, he cleaned his act up after that. I don't know if that's the exact reason why he did. I think it was a wake-up call. You know, he was kind of embarrassed and ashamed. You know, especially that I told him no to, you know. So he straightened his act up. I'm proud of him to do. But your parents never asked you for it? Nah. Nah. My mom never um, did none of that in front of me. I just knew she was, I just knew she was using. Mm -hmm. I never seen her do it. I never seen her, you know, none of that. Did you ever confront her or your father of their drug use? Yeah, of course. Of course. Like, I blamed her for a long time. Like, you know, I was in and out of, I was in foster home. I was in the boys' home. And I blamed them for that, you know, because I went to the foster home because my mom went to prison. Mm. So I was put up for foster care. For how long? I was in foster care for about um, nine months. What age? Um, or what grade? Eight. I was eight. I was like eight years old. And um, I got out of foster care when I was like nine. And before I was in foster care, I was in the boys' home for nine months. Then I got out of boys' club home for nine months and went to foster care for nine months. And then by the time I got out of that, my mom was, um, she still wasn't, you know, right to take care of us. So um, one of my aunts took us in. Now, what is, for somebody watching that doesn't really know too much about boys' home or foster care, what's the difference between the two? Um, a boys' home is basically, um, like you stand on a dome, like, you know, whatever you want compared to a jail dome, college dome, it's just a dome with other people. You know, boys on one side, girls on the other side. And a foster home is you have you actually have a you actually have a parent. You know, you actually have like a foster mom. So that's the difference. It's like they only have staffs at the boys home. Staffs that order you to do this and do that. And foster home, you have a mom that actually, like, it's more comforting, you know. It's more of a mother feeling and a more of a home feeling, you know. You have to go to a boy's dorm or a boy's, what did you say, club or house? No. Um, what did you call A boy's home? Yeah, the boy's what, home. Do you have to go to a boy's home before you go to foster care? Is it like you get picked by a foster Parent. So actually, I just was bad as hell, really. And um, I actually got spelled out of school in second grade for um, throwing scissors at the teacher or something like that, or hitting the teacher or something with the desk or ramming the desk, and something like that. I don't really remember what it was, and I got expelled. And it was like a boy's home for bad children. I was bad as hell. Oh. My mama couldn't control me, you know, so. Okay, so that was before she even went to... Prison. Yeah, this before I went here before she went to prison. Okay. Yeah. So a boy's home, you stay there the whole time. You don't go to your to your mom's house for a little bit. Then you got to go back to the boys' home. Like they put you in this boys' home for a certain yeah, length of time. Yeah, your mom got to come visit you. You can't leave them. Oh. Yeah, you come, you get visits. Why not alternative school? I was young. I can't say exactly. Oh, maybe they don't have it for that age. Oh. Um, I don't think they have it for second graders. I was like second, I was like in second or third grade or something like that. And from my understanding, I went because I was bad and I got expelled. I, re I knew I got expelled out of school. And right after I got expelled out of school, a few le weeks later, I was in a um, boys home. So I never really asked my mom about it when I got older. I just, that's what I believe that happened. Maybe a boys home is for young kids and maybe alternative school is for older, older children. Yeah. Probably so. I never been to alternative school, but so maybe boys boys home is like equivalent to alternative school, but just for a younger age. Group. Yeah. But um, they have boys homes like they have boys homes. They have boys home for kids that's like sixteen, be, like to I the might age be of mistaken. 20, I was just guessing. For the age for the age of twenty one, they have like boys home for bad kids, too as well. They got um, Jetson LTI. Stuff like that. I'll need to look into that. Now, um, when you're in this foster care, 
Uh, how did that go for you? Do you remember? Oh man, I still talk to my foster mom today. Like she's she's she a very beautiful soul. I still talk to her today, all the time. I talked to her. It was um, it was a great. It was it it wasn't a great experience being away from my my original family, my biological family, but she 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 treated me she treated me good like you know she made me feel she made me feel like home did you take her serious or did you treat her like a substitute teacher at first i did at first i did i treated her awful like when i first got there she used to um we used to, i think we went in walgreens or something she bought me these um these pop guns you know the guns that you used to um buy and you press it in it it got the little thing inside the barrel and it snapped. Okay. And then I had another one. It shot little pellets out of it, little plastic pellets. And she made me mad one day, and I, I shot up with the um, <laughs> with the pellets. And she took my guns from me. That's when I first got there. I ain't, you know, I ain't like I ain't want to be there. I wanted to be by my mama. So it's like when she she telling me to do stuff, I'm like, man, you not my mama. Don't tell me what to do. So she made me mad. I got the um pop guns and I shot up. And then she took them from me. She never bought me guns again, ever. And I begged her for to buy me more guns. She never did it. But she was she a very beautiful lady. I love her to death. Do all your siblings go under the same care of the foster parent, or did you guys have to split up? Um, we actually split up. My um, my little sister, like you know, our our brother, our older brother and sister, they was older, so you know, it was probably like sixteen then. They had to grow up fast too. They was like 15, 16. They had jobs in their own apartments. Oh, they were staying with each other. And they was too young to really take us, you know what I'm saying? They wasn't even old enough to have custody over us. And a, a 16 year old with an eight, nine year old, nah, she couldn't take care of me. But she had, a, my sister, older sister had her own apartment. She was 16 years old. And she worked, she had to work the job at Shawnee's and she had her own apartment. but. My little sister went and stayed with my aunt where I later on went after I got out of the foster home. I don't know exactly why I went to the foster home after the boys' home instead of by my aunt. That's something I got to ask my mom. I don't know why. But my sister always was there. Now, you were in street activity in your teenage years. And when it comes to school, I'm assuming here you were one foot in, one foot out. One foot in school, one foot in the streets. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you got out of school completely? Nah. You graduated? I graduated. I actually graduated and then went to college. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because somebody that does street activity, sometimes one foot in, one foot out, sometimes they get so consumed by the street activity lifestyle, they may be making a lot of money. Yeah. Maybe making more money than other students. Maybe making m more money than the teachers that's teaching them. Right, yeah, definitely. They may see no need to go to school anymore. And they drop out, they quit, that sort of thing. I just always had this thing, like, they had times where I wanted to drop out of school, but I always had this thing that I wanted to get, get, I wanted to get a high school diploma. I wanted to go to college. I always did want to get a high school diploma and go to college because I actually was always smart in school. So I never really had a problem with school. It's just that I separated the two. When I was at school, I was at school. When I was off from school, I dealt in street activity. And when I, the next morning I go back to school and it's just a routine every day. When I get off of school, I knew what I was going to do. Now, was this more of a, a self-effort on your behalf, or did somebody push you to finish, at least high school? Um, my, mom, my mama pushed me, pushed me to finish high school because we actually, um, I actually got expelled. Like, I used to get expelled, like, every, I got ex I, like, I, I finished school two years behind, two years behind because I got expelled so much. So my 12th grade year, the year I was supposed to be supposed to graduate, I got expelled for a gang fight. So my mama, um, my mama just actually fought and fought and fought and went to um, different people that was higher than the principals that expelled me and went over the head and she got me back in school the year I was supposed to graduate. 
my mom, my mom didn't let up. When my mom came home from jail, she cleaned our act all the way up, and she just was behind me a hundred percent. Like you know, she refused to let me just be that kid. You know what I'm saying? Even though she she knew the streets was pulling me, she just she refused to let me be that kid. You know. And that's what it was. How many times do you think you were expelled? Um, I got expelled in second grade. I got expelled in um, ninth grade. I got expelled in eleventh grade, and I got expelled in twelfth grade, a full time. What were the other two times? Because the first time in second grade was throwing scissors or hitting your teacher. The last time was a gang fight. What were the two in the middle? Um. So we talking um. Expulsion. Ninth, ninth grade, right? Yeah. Ninth grade. Oh, what did I get a spell for in ninth grade? Oh, I got too many suspensions for like simple. I'll probably have a fight, get suspended, come back. Um, I don't know, probably get taught it three times. You get detention. You get three detentions. You get suspended. It just was adding up like probably have another fight or probably uh, do something to a student or something and get suspended. And you know, once you get three suspensions, that's exposure. So I think in ninth grade, I just had too many suspensions in one year. It got tired of giving me chances. I actually had more than three suspensions because they gave me a couple of chances when they were supposed to expel me and I just kept getting suspended. And then in 11th grade, it was another gang fight. So I had a gang fight in 11th grade and expelled and got had a gang fight in 12th grade and got expelled. Now, speaking of gangs, how big was gang activity in New Orleans back then when you were growing up? Gangs wasn't really big. We wasn't really in the gang. We we had a we had a clique of certain few people we hung with. But you know, if it's two or more in school, they call it a gang fight. We uh, wasn't really a gang. You know, we just was friends and you know. It wasn't a gang at all. We just was basically friends and um for friends that for friends that looked out for each other, friends that rolled for each other. You hit them, you gotta fight me. You know. And you hit them and they friends gotta jump in too. So it just was a gang fight. Two or more a gang fight. You get that's automatic exposure when you have a gang fight.